Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen of the press, and uh, welcome to this morning's press briefing. We are grateful to you uh, for the partnership. As always, every time we call on you, we are always available to help to propagate advanced programs and monetary policy decisions. We are very grateful to you. This press briefing follows the meetings of the Monetary Policy Committee. And this morning, we will be listening to the chairman. As always, we will give you an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. This press briefing is live on Facebook at the Bank of Ghana and also at the Bank of Ghana website, bog.gov.gh. We are grateful to some of the media houses who are streaming this press briefing on their media portals. Thank you very much. It's time to listen to the chairman, the chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee and governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Enesade Asset. Dr. Enesade Asset. Respectfully, chairman, we are ready to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sami. And we haven't had this in this MPC role for a while. And it feels good to come back to the room. This is really where all the technical discussions take place. Uh, maybe we should find a way of bringing the press conferences back back here. Uh, it feels even more professional than that big auditorium where you know you have so many people. So good morning again ladies and gentlemen of the media. I don't see the, the ladies here. Uh, Sami. And, and welcome to the press briefing after the 108th Monetary Policy Committee meeting which took place this week. The committee deliberated on recent macroeconomic developments and assessed the risk to the inflation and growth outlook. A summary of the assessment to the key considerations that informed the committee's decision on the stance of monetary policy is provided below. Global economic conditions remain challenging. Global growth is slowing more than anticipated and financing conditions have tightened some more since the August EMPC emergency meeting, reflecting further synchronous tightening of monetary policy rates across advanced economies and emerging markets. The Russia-Ukraine war has persisted, dragging down growth and putting additional pressure on prices, especially for food and energy, with the economic and social spillovers. Against the backdrop of these headwinds, the IMF World Economic Outlook update in July 2022 projected global growth at 3.2% in 2022, almost half of the 6.1% outturn recorded in 2021. The wave of inflationary pressure spreading across several economies remain elevated and have now become broad-based across all items in the consumer basket. However, there are signs that the global price pressures may be peaking as the major drivers of inflation ease somewhat alongside the synchronized tightening of monetary policy across countries. The Fed's initial estimates, which showed that global supply chain disruptions have eased steadily since May 2022, the fifth monthly consecutive monthly decline in the Food and Agricultural Organization's Food Price Index for August 2022, and the recent dip in crude oil prices on the back of weakened global growth prospects are all suggestive of peaking of global inflation. Global financing conditions remain tight as central banks in advanced economies raise policy rates significantly to decisively contain inflation pressures. The Fed's continued hike in interest rates has strengthened the US dollar, instigating a sharp rise 
in long-term bond yields, along with a sharp decline in stock prices. The monetary policy tightening trend has resulted in widening sovereign bond spreads across emerging markets and developing economies, leading to higher currency depreciation, currency risks, and elevated debt profiles. On the domestic front, economic growth appeared strong in the second quarter. The latest data released by the Ghana Statistical Service estimated real GDP growth for the second quarter of 2022 at 4.8% compared with 4.2% recorded in the second quarter of 2021. Non-oil GDP grew slower at 6.2% against 6.6% growth in the same comparative period. The relatively strong growth recorded in the second quarter was largely driven by the service and industry subsectors, the latter boasted by the manufacturing sector. The latest Bank of Ghana high frequency indicators signaled some moderation in economic activity. The Composite Index of Economic Activity recorded an annual growth of 0.5% in July to 2022 compared to 1.6% in June 2022 and 5% in December 2021. The sources of the slowdown were from construction and port activities. Reserve money for the period under review increased at a slower pace relative to a year ago. Annual growth in reserve money was 33.1% in August 2022 compared with 36.1% in August 2021. Broad money supply, M2+, plus, increased marginally due to a sharp fall in net foreign assets which moderated the expansion in the net domestic assets of the depository corporation sector. M2 Plus grew by 23.4% year-on-year in August 2022 compared with 20.2% in the same period of 2021. The latest credit condition survey conducted in August 2022 indicated an overall net tightening of credit stance to corporates and households by the commercial banks. This was reflected in the steady increase in average lending rates. This notwithstanding, new advances increased by 56.1% year-on-year to $33.8 billion in August 2022, relative to a 4.9% increase in August 2021. Annual growth in private sector credit was 35.8% in August. 2022 compared with 9.6 percent a year ago. In real terms, private sector credit increased, albeit marginally, to 1.4 percent due to sustained price pressures. This compares with a contraction of 0.2 percent over the same period in 2021. Results from the bank's August 2022 confidence surveys showed further softening of business and consumer sentiments. While consumer confidence dipped on account of rising inflation, business sentiment softened on the back of concerns about price pressures, currency depreciation, and weakening consumer demand. The survey findings were broadly in line with an observed downturn in the Ghana's Purchasing Managers Index in August 2022. Banking sector performance remained resilient as at the end of August 2022. Total assets increased by 22.9% on year-on-year basis to 204.6 billion Ghana CDs in August 2022 due to sustained growth in deposits compared to a 16.7% annual growth in the previous year. Total deposits increased by 22.5% to 136.7 billion Ghana cities, relative to 21.8% growth in August 2021. 
The key financial soundness indicators of the banking industry have remained positive in the year, with capital adequacy ratio at 18.1%, well above the regulatory minimum of 13%. The sector was also liquid, reflected by a, an increase in core liquid assets to short-term liabilities of 31.1% in August 2022 from 24.7% in the previous year. Asset quality also improved as the non-performing loans ratio declined to 14.3% at end August 2022 from 17.3% in August 2021, reflecting partly the higher level of outstanding loans. Profit before tax for banks stood at 6.1 billion Ghana cities in August 2022, representing an annual growth of 25.2% compared to 27.4% in the previous year. Net interest income grew by 17.3% compared to 17.9%. Net fees and commissions also increased by 26.9% to 2.3 billion Ghana cities, compared with 21% growth in the previous year, reflecting the rebound in credit growth, as well as an increase in trade related, trade finance related business. Other income of banks grew by 85.6% to 2 billion Ghana cities compared with a contraction of 5.4% a year ago. These developments resulted in a 25.5% growth in operating income to 14.2 billion Ghana cities relative to a growth of 15.7% in the previous year. Operating expenses, however, increased sharply by 24.3% in August 2022, compared to 9% growth in August 2021, partly reflecting the impact of inflation on banks' operations. Price pressures have remained elevated. The latest reading indicated that headline inflation rose to 33.9% in August 2022 from 31.7% in July and 29.8% in June. The rise in the August inflation was broad-based, driven by both food and non-food prices. Food inflation rose to 34.4% from 32.3% in July, whereas non-food inflation jumped to 33.6% from 31.3% over the same comparative period. The upturn in food and non-food inflation was influenced by prices of both local and imported components in the consumer price basket. In line with these trends, underlying inflation pressures remain heightened. The bank's core inflation measure, which excludes energy and utility, increased further to 32.6% in August from 30.2% in July 2022. Similarly, all the other core measures of inflation rose, reflecting the generalized increase in price levels. The bank's latest surveys showed that increased inflation expectations across consumers, businesses, and the financial sectors. Notwithstanding the above trends, Monthly inflation has declined for four consecutive months, reflecting a slowdown in the rate of increase in inflation. Short-term interest rates on the money market have reflected recent developments, while medium to long-term rates have remained relatively behind the yield curve. For example, whilst the discount rate on the 91-day instrument has increased, to 29.7% in September 2022 from 12.5% in September 2021. The coupon rates on the 7-year, 10-year, 15-year and 20-year have remained unchanged at 18.1%, 19.8%, 20.1%, 21.8%, 
20% and 20.2% respectively. The interbank market weighted average rate has increased to 22.05% in September 2022 from 12.61% in September 2021 consistent with the rise in the policy rate. Average lending rates of banks have also adjusted upwards to 29.81% in September 2022 from 20.20% .20 recorded in the corresponding period of 2021. Budget implementation using banking sector data for the first nine months of the year recorded an elevated overall cash deficit of 6.4% of GDP against the revised program target of 5% of GDP. Total receipts of 51.49 billion or 8.7% of GDP over the period fell short of the projected target of 60.08 billion 10.2% of GDP and represented 85.7% of the budgeted estimate. Total payments of 89 billion, that is 15% of GDP, was almost on target, representing 99.5% of 89.46 billion. The deficit of 37.56 billion together with the net foreign loan repayment of 3.5 billion Ghana cities, created a resource gap of 41.1 billion Ghana cities, which was financed from domestic sources and use of resources from the Stabilization Fund. Ghana's main export commodities saw mixed developments on the international markets. The strong rally in Brent crude oil prices since the start of 2022 slowed somewhat to settle at $97.7 per barrel, representing a 30.7% year-to-date gain on the back of the global recession concerns. On cocoa, prices have eased to $2,385.9 US dollars per ton, representing a contraction of 3.9% on a year-to-date basis. Gold prices also fell by 1.5% to settle at 1,763.7 US dollars per fine ounce due to higher bond yields and a stronger US dollar as the US Fed reaffirmed its commitment to bring inflation under control. At the end of August 2022, the trade surplus was 1.7 billion US dollars, exceeding the surplus of 892.4 million US dollars recorded in August 2021. This was driven by higher receipts from gold, crude oil, and non traditional exports, notwithstanding increased demand for oil and gas imports. Total exports went up by 19.5% year on year to 11.8 billion US dollars. Crude oil exports total 3.8 billion US dollars, 56.5% higher than observed in 2021, mainly due to price effects. Gold export earnings also went up by 23.9% to 4.2 billion US dollars, supported by increased production volumes also triggered by the positive response from small-scale gold exporters to the downward revision in the withholding tax regime from 3% to 1.5%. However, on account of lower prices and lower cocoa purchases, cocoa receipts declined by 22.8% to 1.7 billion US dollars from 2.1 billion a year ago. Total merchandise imports grew by 12.9% on a year-on-year -year basis to 10.2 billion US dollars, mainly driven by higher oil and gas import bill of 3.1 billion US dollars 
at the end of August 2022 relative to an in oil and gas import bill of 1.7 billion in the same period of 2021. Non-oil imports, however, dipped by 3.8% year on year to 7.1 billion US dollars in the review period. The stock of gross international reserves declined to 6.6 .6 billion, equivalent to 2.9 months of import cover for goods and services in September 2022. This compares with the December 2021 position of 9.7 billion US dollars, which was equivalent to 4.3 months of import cover. Net international reserves, which excludes encumbered assets and petroleum funds, is estimated at 2.7 billion as at the end of September 2022. In the year to September 2022, the Ghana CD has depreciated by 37.5%, 24.1%, and 27.5% against the US dollar, the pound, and the euro, respectively. In comparison with the same period last year, the CD fared better, depreciating by 1.8%, 0.5% against the US dollar and the pound, respectively, and appreciated by 4% against the euro. The depreciation of the currency was driven by a higher crude oil product import bill on the back of rising prices, the non rollover of maturing bonds by non resident investors, portfolio reversals, the sudden exit of non-resident investors in our bond markets, as well as the loss of market access to euro bond resources. The effect of these factors have been exacerbated by the strength of the US dollar, resulting in depreciation of the local currency from the beginning of the year to date. Summary and Outlook Recent global developments reflect, among others, heightened economic and policy uncertainties, fostered by the strong commitment on the part of advanced economies to decisively tackle inflation. This has triggered a wave of monetary policy tightening by most central banks across advanced economies and strengthening of the US dollar. Against other major international currencies, the US dollar has appreciated by some 15%. Consequently, global financing conditions have tightened further, with spillovers in the financial markets of emerging markets and developing economies. Driven in large part by these factors, several currencies have weakened against the US dollar, resulting in faster paced capital flow reversals from emerging and developing economies, including Ghana. On the fiscal situation, while expenditures have been broadly on target, revenue performance has been below expectations, complicating fiscal policy implementation. Financing of the budget so far has predominantly been from the banking sector, with the central bank absorbing a larger share. Persistent uncovered auctions and portfolio reversals by non-resident investors continue to pose risk to the financing of the budget, resulting in monetization of the budget deficit by the central bank. The Monetary Policy Committee recognizes the fact that the current condition is suboptimal and will be interim until agreements are reached on an IMF-supported program. The committee assesses that the engagement with the IMF has been positive and early conclusion of program discussions will help re-anchor stability. The outlook for the Ghana City has improved, aided by the recent disbursement of the loan from Afri Exim Bank of 750 million US dollars the signing of the syndicated COCO loan of 1.13 million US dollars and the agreement with Gold and Oil Companies 
to purchase the repatriated foreign exchange earnings estimated at 83.9 million US dollars so far. All of these should help to stabilize the Ghana city. Inflation remains elevated and the balance of risk is on the upside. Although the forecasts are for monthly inflation to continue to slow down, the risks are on the upside, emanating largely from the pass-through effects of the currency depreciation, the recent upward adjustment in utility tariffs, and rising inflation expectations. The committee remains committed to re-anchoring inflation expectations and returning to a disinflation path. Under the circumstances, the Monetary Policy Committee decided to increase the monetary policy rate by 250 basis points to 24.5 percent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very big round of applause for Mr. Chairman. It's question time. Uh, just one question each for each media house. So um, let's keep our questions very simple. Jafi, just one question. I'm very brief. Thank you. Hello. Just go ahead. Hi, Mr. Governor, do, do you think that the, the time has come for the committee post uh, MPC to also give us some data on how these uh, policy rates adjustment has impacted the market? If, for instance, it was meant to mop up excess liquidity, that data is shared with the public because there is still an argument about whether we are getting the necessary response from the market from these uh, policy rate adjustments. While some market persons are raising questions about these hikes, the World Bank in its latest Africa Pulse report also said that the, the, the committee was late in responding to the hikes in inflation rates and all those things, so that we can get a better understanding of how your action is impacting the market. While some are questioning the policy rate hikes because the economy is not responding, your development partner is also saying that you were late in coming to the market. If you had come in earlier and taken the necessary measures, things could have been under control. Thank you. Mr. Rafi, thank you. Mr. Bede, tell you Your name is Media House first. My name is... My name is... My name is Obeda Tarebua from Business and Financial Times. So right now, considering that about half of the uh, bank's assets are channeled about half of the bank's assets are channeled into short government short-term bills, and with debt levels hitting unsustainable levels, sparking fears that government may even default in its short-term bills. Do you think that we have a safe banking sector, considering that um, background? And then secondly, it's, um, it's, it's part of the question, please. No, just one. It's just composite. One. composite Respectfully, just one. Yes, please. So I said it's composite. All right, thank you. Go ahead. So yes, we, we are looking at debt levels hitting 104% according to World Bank's projection. Um, people are calling for capping of the debt levels or debts. What do you make of it, please? Thank you very much. Uh, Sunny. Okay. Okay, Maxwell. Just my name is just one. Respectfully, just one. Yes, just just one. But no, just one. Respectfully, I, just I one. I have some clarification. Governor mentioned that the amount that the repatriated funds that will be purchased. He mentioned eighty-three million or so. I, that looks small for me. I don't know if I'm wrong. So just a bit of clarification on that. On the rate hike. Governor, you, you mentioned that I didn't get you. Uh, the repatriated funds, the authorization for banks to uh, purchase uh, repatriated foreign exchange. You mentioned that it, if I got you right, like, 83 million. 89. 89. Yeah. My main question is on the rate time. You mentioned that the central bank is the largest financier of the bank now. Of the deficit, and we understand. 
So coming on the back of that and increasing the rate by 250% as you've been doing, I mean 250 basis points as you've been doing, do you not think that you are trying to mop up your own money? You are putting your own pressure in the system and trying to absorb it. And that generally has been the concern. And once you've admitted it, what then informed the decision to go ahead? Thank you, Maxwell. The last question for today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Sain Abrahman. I work with the Media General. Uh, there is a call on the bank to be innovative in its fight against uh, inflation. We've seen Turkey, despite the price pressures, cutting rates, and many had expected the bank to tow uh, a similar line. Uh, will the bank recommend to government to cut fuel price, for example, since it's part of the key drivers of inflation? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that uh, the type of innovation in Turkey is exactly what we don't want to do. And if you've been following the story in Turkey, the reductions in policy rate at the time that you know you're having all these global shocks and high inflation has led to a very sharp collapse of currency in Turkey, the Turkish lira, and a large capital outflow from their economy. So that's what the wrong policy does. Uh, you're going to see yourself with more inflation, you're going to see yourself with a larger capital outflow, and eventually that is also going to collapse your growth. So I think that kind of innovation, we don't want to experiment with it. The kind of innovation that we are doing right now has to do with the earlier issue of the gold purchases and the gold purchasing program that the central bank has put into place. Uh, you would recollect that we started this almost a year ago and I think that we are making progress. Uh, we were uh, initially uh, buying from the new months and the more established gold firms and uh, those ones are refined outside uh, already so it was quite straightforward but we are also uh, dealing with PMMC and refining I mean exporting Dory gold which would uh, eventually be refined so I think that the central bank under the circumstances has has been very innovative uh, in our dealing with uh, the circumstances under which uh, we find ourselves. Capping fuel prices is not an innovation. In fact, it's a wrong policy when you have fuel prices rising and, and you also have a budget deficit problem. Who is going to pay for the difference in uh, the, the, the cost of fuel? And, and that would create even further fiscal subsidies and worsen your fiscal deficit problem that you know we are all trying to resolve. So on the contrary, we, we should really be pushing towards full cost recovery to minimize uh, the burden on the budget. Uh, the best way to deal with the inflation problem is on the monetary policy side and then on the government side to do what it can on the supply supply side, which should bring me to the question raised by George Uafi from Joy FM on the impact of the monetary policy rate and what people are, are saying and, and, and the fact that the World Bank is saying that we were even late. They are of the other view that the monetary policy tightening is the way to go, except that we are late by their assessment, which I also disagree with. Because if you would recollect, you know, we started this uh, policy tightening as far back as November 2021, right? It wasn't in January when we got locked out of the market that the MPC started tightening rates. We had already foreseen, you know, issues of prices rising. And therefore, in November 2021, 
we did our first tightening of the monetary policy rate. We were even ahead of the Fed and some of the more advanced countries, you know, in, in tightening uh, our, our policy rate. And I believe even in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Bank of Ghana was one of the first central banks that moved away from this easing of a monetary policy stance because of the impact of COVID, right? Uh, uh, to, to the tightening stance because we could see that it was about time that, the, you know, we had a shift in policy stance because we were moving away from the impact of the pandemic into this new regime of, of higher inflation rates. Then the issue about whether we are seeing the impact, uh, the transmission. In our view, this policy is working. And one of the things we focused on has been the monthly increases in the rate of inflation. If you look at it, you look at the monthly changes in inflation, there, there is some softening of the pace at which uh, prices are rising. That obviously uh, suggests that th th there is, you know, at least some impact on the overall price level. But I also recognize the point that all your questions are interrelated. But the point that Maxwell raised about raising the policy rate at a time that we are the main financier you know, of the budget. Uh, it, it's, it's a very critical point. Uh, and if you listen to the press release that the central bank assesses the situation as suboptimal, right? This is not the optimal thing to do. But under the circumstances, until we agree on the program with the fund, right? Uh, we have to contain the situation. The government machinery must work, and therefore we have to help the government machinery to, to, to go on whilst we address the larger macroeconomic imbalances, depending on the policies that are agreed and under the fund program. So yes, all, I mean, almost all the four questions are interlinked somewhat. Impact of monetary policy rate and inflation. Remember, inflation is both a demand and a supply side problem. On the demand side, tightening of monetary policy is meant to tighten credit conditions, is meant to curtail demand conditions. And I think that that's the best that the central bank can contribute to the disinflation process. But the supply side issues also have to be addressed. Uh, issues of production, uh, issues of investments that would enhance the, you know, the economic capacity for the economy to grow. All of that also helps to bring inflation down. So, yes, the, the banking assets question, uh, the colleague here who asked that question on bank assets in government, and we really didn't want to get into the discussion on debt because these are discussions that are still ongoing. You are aware that the debt sustainability analysis is still ongoing. And at the appropriate time, the details of the assessment will, will come out. But I think the minister has been clear that whatever is done, the financial sector is important to us. Uh, to the extent that we don't have access to the international capital markets, the only other source of financing left are the banks and the SDIs and the pension funds and the insurance firms. So whatever decisions are taken would be taken bearing in mind the stability of our financial system and ensure that there are no major negative impacts. I think that's the best assurance I can give you at this stage. So, yes, and the repatriation of the funds, uh, dollars, I think I mentioned 81. Uh, the forecast gold purchases 
uh, that we had from for the last quarter of this year, the total was estimated at 185,365 ounces. This is really what, what has been forecasted for the rest of this year, which is supposed to bring in nearly 270 million. And we've done 89 million of that so far. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think we... Sure, sure. Sure. No, the issue of the capping of the debt, I think this is something that could be looked at. I mean, if you look at the European Union, they had the Maastricht criteria, which had the debt ceiling. Uh, in our own convergence discussions with the West African common currency, we were discussing debt ceiling. So it, it's not unusual to set, you know, caps for attaining certain objectives. So, I mean, if Ghanaians think that we've reached a point that we want to uh, cap debts. That, I mean, that debate can be had, and we'll look at the pros and cons of that type of decision. So, well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press. As always, the data of research will be available to provide some uh, clarifications on some of the issues. Uh, so, that will be after this engagement. So, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, great for your time. God willing, we'll meet soon. Have a good afternoon.